And today I'm talking about scoping e-commerce projects. And more often than not, when I talk to people who work on e-commerce projects, I discover that they step into it a little too lightly, a little too casual, with not enough preparation, not enough knowledge, and then downstream lose their shirts. Does that make sense? All right, so that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to cover a whole lot of uh, information, and so if you're the kind of person who's like, oh, I, you went too fast, or I, I didn't write it all down, here's where the slides are located, right? So if you go to slideshare.net slash cflemma, you will find all my slide decks, but the first one is this one, right? And so we're going to cover 10 different areas, and in those 10 areas, we're going to cover four questions each, right? So there's 40 questions we're going to cover, and to do that, you might go, well, I sure would like to know where the slides are. So here it is so that you don't have to freak out about getting all these questions. And as I mentioned, right, the biggest risk, the largest risk when you're building out stores happen way before you start writing it. Right? The biggest challenges all happen because you don't take enough time to ask the questions. You don't take enough time to understand the customer. You don't take enough time to help the customer think through their strategies. And so later it pops up. Right? It just pops, it's like they say something, right? Like you have a customer who's like in the middle of your project, they've never talked about anything except plain vanilla, e-commerce, and all they do is talk about design, design, design. So you're working so hard, you got a designer, you're doing iterations, you're doing all this great work, and then like two weeks before it goes live, they're like, where's the wish list functionality? And you're like, what? And they say the words that every freelancer and agency that does e-commerce loves to hear. Well, on Amazon, and you're like, right, because you have Amazon budget? Like, what, what, why are we talking about this, right? But you don't want to discover that two weeks before you go live, right? So what we're going to do is talk about these 10 scoping areas, right? Understand the customer, understand the project, understand the store, think about products, think about the visitors, think about orders and demand or scale, the features. I put a nice, bright, you know, like, oh, because this is the way customers work, right? Ooh, I have an idea, right? But in the end, it feels like a complication. Uh, and then, post it, all right? Um, so, I should caveat this before we get into uh, any of the questions, is if you ask a question, hey, what do you think about this? And they go, I don't know, what do you think? That's not necessarily bad, right? There's nothing wrong with a customer not being fully immersed in the world of e-commerce and knowing every possibility and having a, an opinion on every possible thing. That's not bad. But if you don't budget for every one of those, I don't know, what do you think, right? Budget to do research. You have to look at all the options, right? Budget to figure out, okay, what's the right strategy? Budget to have the conversation and say, hey, customer, you got this option, you got this option, I recommend this, but here's this. And then to go forward, you're talking about hours that you may have missed for every different, I don't know, what do you think? Does that make sense? All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna get into these 10 areas. And the first area is the customer background, right? You ask, who built the current site, and how did you find them? Now you're going, what does this have to do with the stuff I gotta build, right? No, it doesn't have to do with the stuff you have to build. It has to do with the person sitting across the table from you, right? And more often than not, we jump right into, right? We start asking, okay, what feature and what design, and what feature and what design, and we're thinking through all the solutions without paying attention to the fact that there's someone sitting in front of us, and we need to understand what's going on there. Now imagine if the customer in front of you said something like, well, you're my 16th developer in the last year. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, I want to ask more about that, right? What happened? What was going on, right? How did you find them? Well, here's what I do, right? I have a nephew, my nephew's super cool. I go to my nephew and I say, who should I hire to build my website? And my nephew tells me everything. Like, okay, that's odd, right? But not, I mean, I don't know your nephew, I can't decide, right? Then someone else says, well, I have, a, I have a spiritualist and I take it to my spiritualist. Or someone else says, well, I have a buddy of mine who runs at Amazon and so I just ask him what to do. And it doesn't matter what you get as an answer, you just need to be aware of, okay, I need to understand what I'm dealing with here. I need to understand who's across the table and what their expectations and what the dynamics are and how do I protect myself in the midst of this, right? The next one, who does the maintenance, right? You may be sitting in the world of thinking, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna build the website and then we're gonna hand it off to their internal team to manage it from here. And then you may discover they don't have an internal team. 
or you may be working on the presumption that you're building it and you will maintain it. So you can, you know, I'm going to use my framework because I know how to do this, etc. And then they say, oh no, 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 we have an internal team that's going to do this. Right? So understanding what, what's the plan here, right? Tell me more about your organization. Help me understand who's doing what. Who does the maintenance? Does that make sense? All right. How does this store fit into the business model? I worked on a website once on, on a store for a, a fairly large known company, uh, and I thought, oh my god, this is going to be awesome. We're going to do this. Well, it turned out, no, that wasn't the case. It was a pet project. It was a pet project for one of the senior VPs at the company. And so I thought, okay, this is going to be a big, this is going to be huge, right? So I'm, what am I doing, right? I'm, I'm thinking, yes, I want to make money, but also I really want you know, to get my name and lights as it relates to this kind of project with this kind of company, and this is going to be awesome. And then that stakeholder, that key person, um, lost power and authority in their organization. And suddenly the project just got killed, right? And you go, well, what's going on? Well, because I presume that this store was going to be intrinsic to their overall business model. And it wasn't related at all, right? They could kill it without blinking. It didn't affect them. So understanding, wait, how do you guys make money? Right? How do you, wait, where are you, what is the, the flow within which this product sits in terms of how you generate revenue? Where, what is this part? We built a site once where it was like, we want this whole store thing, and then they were like, okay, now turn off all the buy buttons. You're like, what? And we've been building this store for weeks, and they're like, just turn off all the buy buttons. It's just a catalog. And you're like, if it was a catalog, we could have done this in such a different way. But again, you just realize, I didn't ask about what they were planning to use it for, how it fit into their overall business model. And lastly, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times you think you're sitting in front of the key stakeholder, the person who makes the final decision, the one who approves. And it's not just because you know, you're not thinking. It's because they're acting that way. Right? Like all the first iterations of the design, they say, I don't like that, I do like this. Okay, now we're good. I don't like that, I do like this, we're good. And so they're doing it. They're acting as the final say. And then you get all done with the project, right? And you're now ready to launch. And it turns out someone else has to look at it. And someone else comes in, and it's brand new requirements time. Oh! Now that I'm, and, you know, and, and the, the other person that you've been interacting with is like, oh, well now I've got to take it up to my boss. Right? I wasn't going to show it to my boss until I was totally happy. But now my boss has to look at it, and my boss has to make the call. And the boss shows up and goes, well, you haven't done this. You haven't integrated with this. This doesn't look right because of this. we got to make sure you get so-and-so in here to, to evaluate this part of it. And the project just goes, doubles in size, without doubling your revenue. Right? Project cost stays the same. Expectations just grow. And you're like, whoa. So you start earlier. Tell me about the process. Tell me. And sometimes you just have to ask silly questions and be super comfortable asking silly questions. Like, so if you like zebra stripes and I build this whole thing designed with zebra stripes and then we launch it, there's nobody in your company who can reject your idea of zebra stripes? And they're like, well, actually, um, I mean, I would never pick zebra stripes. I'm a more cheetah guy, but seriously, uh, you know, yeah, actually, there's this person and this person. You're like, oh, who are they? Tell me more about them. How does this work? Would they have to do it if you put the color blue, right? If you have to put the shade of blue? But just tell me who are these other people. But you have to be willing to dig in a little and get people to react so that you understand what you're doing. And sometimes the stakeholders are not in the business that you're talking to, right? Lo and behold, for e-commerce, they may have tax partners, shipping partners, uh, procurement, supply, distribution, fulfillment, all sorts of kind of partners that need sign off on something, right? And then you're like, oh, oh man, we, we better go figure this out. You don't want to find those out at the end. All right? Make sense? Good? It's not the end all, right? I'm not saying ask these four questions and then never talk to the customer again. I'm just saying, let's make sure you remember to ask these questions because they will help you in understanding the scope of your project. So then you dig in a little to the project itself, right? Hey, do you have a target date for when you need this to go live? I joined a company once. We were building a very, very large e-commerce platform, a business-to-business -business marketplace exchange. 
And uh, the whole time we were chatting, right, I, I was feeling pretty good. I had a, a multi-million dollar budget. I had the ability to go hire my own team. Uh, everything was awesome, right? Uh, and then when we got, I got hired and then I had 30 days to bring the team together. So I brought the team together in 30 days. We got ready to build out the prototype in 30 days. And then it was time to start writing the real code, right? And uh, we get into it. And we're, the team's already there, so the 30 days are in, and maybe we're halfway into the prototype, and uh, the, the exec team comes back and says, hey, by the way, we want to launch this at this very large car, car show. And uh, it's in Germany, and this is the date. And I'm like, well, I thought we had a year and a half. And they're like, well, because we want to launch it at this, uh, at this car show, we need you done in seven months. If you take a, <laughs> a you know, 18 month project turned into a seven month project, right? Um, you will hate your life. I know from experience, right? We did 20 hour days, uh, six days a week. We had half a day off for Christmas. Um, I mean, it was insane. Now, we got it launched, which was good news, right? We did a billion dollars worth of transactions in six months, and everything was wonderful, except my personal life, right? So when we were done with the project, my wife's like, and I think it's time for you to find another job. She's like, oh, I didn't realize that those timelines are going to be those timelines. Now, not everybody has that kind of craziness, but you may still have a customer who says, oh, actually, this is a hard date. Not when you get done. It's a hard date. The date is for this show or this event or this partner meeting or something. And you're like, I need to know which dates are just so locked in that, that I have to know. You've got to have everything done by then. All right, can you share your project's budget, right? Can you share it? Now, some people will say, uh, no, I'm not telling you what I'm budgeted for. Like, okay. I, uh, I thought I was super sneaky, right? I thought I was, I was sharp. I, uh, I asked a guy to come build a pool in our backyard, right? And I had a whole, I mean, it wasn't just a pool, right? It's the, it's the decking, it's the awning, it's cutting into the hill. It's this huge pool, it's a very large jacuzzi, it's a waterfall, there's a cave behind the waterfall. I got this whole plan, and then he says, all right, what's your budget? And I go, I'm not negotiating with myself, you tell me what it would cost. Because I thought, I'm smart at this. And he goes, well, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. In general, uh, whatever you had budgeted is probably twice that. And I said, I'm not spending, and I threw out a number, which was essentially 2x what I've been thinking. And so then he did divide by half, and he said, so you're thinking about this kind of budget. And I was like, you tricked me. <laughs> How'd you do that? That's insane. Right? But he was like, look, at the end of the day, right, everybody has an idea of what they want to spend. Right? Everybody has an idea of what they want to spend. And the trick for us when we're talking to a customer and trying to understand that is to say, are you willing to share with me, right, ballpark, right, where are you at? And we've done, you can tell, we've done projects at 5,000, or we've done projects that if you're in the 25 to 50 range, 50,000, like you, wherever you are, you said we've done projects this level, and we've done projects this level, I just want to understand where you're sitting, right? But ask, some people say, oh, they'll never tell me. Well, you won't know unless you ask. So ask about the budget. Another of my favorites is, hey, do you have a list of requirements already written out? This sounds horrible, right? Because almost no client ever says, well, actually, I do. It's all right here, right? More often than not, they're like, no, 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 I just know what I like. And you're like, great, right? But let's be clear. If we don't have a clear articulation spec, that's not, an end, that's not like a death knell on the project. That's fine. But we may need to kick into a discovery project, right, where we actually tease out some things and facilitate getting that requirement. And the reason I love discovery projects is because it's not just my ability to dig in deeper and understand and be able to have a, a, a focused scope of what the project is, but I get that extra little time to figure out, is this the person or the company I want to do work with? So at the end of the scoping, at the end of the discovery, I might have a great report. I might be able to give them a report that says, these are all the requirements you have, and here's a quote that we think it would cost to do it, but I can also say, you can shop it around and go look for the quotes, and it turns out, now that we see the magnitude of this project, we're probably not a good fit, or we don't have this kind of time, or we won't be available until next summer. Whatever you want, if you want to disengage, because suddenly there's enough red flags in the process that you go, uh, I don't want to do, I don't want to get into the project with this person. Does that make sense? All right, 
Now, I know that every time we talk about priority or trade-off, I know someone's going to say, well, hold on, I hate those things, right? You know, here are three, pick two, blah, blah, blah. And so I understand that, but I do want to highlight there is a certain kind of prioritization in e-commerce that can be really helpful, right? And it's, it's these three things. It's the speed of the store. It's the speed of the project itself. And it's the design. Every one of those has a cost factor when it comes to time, right? If you want an elaborate design, if you want you know, custom templates for every category and different ones for different categories, and you want custom templates for product pages and also different ones based on the kind of product it is, et cetera, right? There's gonna be time and design. If you just want the shortest product so you can launch the fastest, right? That's the speed of dev and that's gonna be great, but you're gonna make trade-offs from there. And then if someone says, oh, no, 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 but I thought it would be fast, and you're like, no, optimizing the store for speed is a whole different ballgame. And it won't come just naturally because I threw some stuff together. We just, we just worked on a project. I, I work at a company called LiquidWeb, and we have a platform for, for hosting WooCommerce. And we had a client cause or a prospect cause. Their whole website crashed uh, on Sunday, right? Sunday, a week ago, right? Um, and it was their biggest launch. They've been prepping for six months, right? And the site crashed after three minutes on AWS, and it, was, it wasn't it was AWS's fault, it was a misconfiguration in some of the infrastructure, but, uh, but the, the, the code for the site was just not, it was not coded for speed, performance, scalability. So every page loaded in anywhere from 13 to 24 seconds, right? At which point you're like, I wouldn't call this a store, right? I might call it a museum. I'm going to spend a lot of time just waiting for these things to appear for you, but uh, no one's buying anything, right? And so we spent 48 hours, right, recoding stuff for a, a portion of the, the new products, right, a little micro site, and we launched it, and uh, Tuesday night it went live. They made more money in the first two hours of Tuesday night than they had all through the whole year today, right? They made more money in every, every 10 minutes than they had made in their best days in December, which was their highest month last week. Um, everything's great, but when you code for the speed of the site, the, the performance of the site, you code differently, right? Now, some people who are really great coders would say, that's the way I code everything. But in general, when you are out there doing projects, you're like, oh, I like this theme, or the customer shows up and says, I like this theme, and all of a sudden, you, and I want these features, and you start adding plugins, and by the time you're done, you got a four second, six second, eight second load. I no, 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 when we launched it, right, it was like 0.7 seconds on load, and we were like, oh, you're going to be fine. And they, they were, right? They had, they had 7,000 page views a, a minute, right? People were just moving through the site. Two, 300 concurrent users in checkout. And you go, yeah, but it's because it's coded for the speed of the store. So when you're asking that customer a question about, tell me, tell me about your priorities. Like, let's just help understand this, right? It's not that there's a specific answer. It's you trying to determine and understand, right, what's important. When we were talking to this client, it was Sunday night at 2 in the morning. And I had the development team on, their previous development team, and I had the business on. And I said, why are you doing this this way? I would get rid of all this. You're adding a whole bunch of calls back to the database. Let's just clear this out. And the developer said, yeah, but that's what they wanted so that they could have this design. And I, I looked at the client and I said, we were on video. And I looked at the client and I said, we're going to have to sacrifice some of the things you wanted for the big thing you want, right? Which is customers, throughput, scalability, and sales. And the customer was like, yep, makes sense, do it. But that conversation had clearly never happened with their developer, right? And so the developer was doing their best to deliver value to the customer without having this kind of conversation. All right, store, store back, right? One of my favorite questions, hey, what's broken right now, right? If this is not a brand new build, what's broken lets that customer pinpoint the thing that they're really unhappy about and tell it to you. And the thing is, sometimes you hear the strangest answers that you're like, in a normal intake, I would have never gotten to this. Right? I would have never gotten to this. And you're like, what, what are you talking about? Right? They're like, well, when someone makes an order, I need emails to go here and here. And you go, yeah, of course, that makes sense. Well, I also need emails to go to this, or this, or this, this, or this, based on which product group it was in. And you're like, what? Wait, go back. What are you talking about? Well, the other system doesn't do it. I'm like, no system does that. Like, tell me what it is you want and why and explain it to me. And when people are talking about the thing that's broken, from their perspective, what they're telling you is, 
these are things I wish the site did that it doesn't do, and I think they're priority enough to talk about. And you go, great. I want that insight so I can scope it into my work, even if it's going to be custom only. The other one, hey, what feature are you most proud of? Right? What do you love? What can you not get rid of? Right? And maybe that, that wish list or that gift card or that couponing is the thing they are like, this is the best thing ever for us. Right? I worked with a with a store that when you bought something on the store, right, sorry, when you bought something in their physical store, they gave you a code that allowed you to go to their online store. So their chief product was sold in a physical store. But if you bought there, then you got a code for the online store. And the online store only sold accessories, but it was closed out to everything. The only way you got in was with that code. Well, when they showed us the demo of the store several times over, right, they never did the whole, it's not, like, you can't get in. They just showed us the store. We were talking about features in the store. And so when you finally get to this one, you're like, hey, what do you like? Oh, I love the fact that we can just put in this code and then we have access, and I'm like, wait, 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 back up. What are you talking about? Like, we've seen the demo three times, never seen that. And they're like, oh, no, it's, it's that you can't log in unless you have this code. I'm like, is it one code per customer? Is it one code for everyone? What happened? You know, and all of a sudden, there's a whole new set of questions because you're asking the question, hey, what do you love the most? Also, what feature costs you the most? Right? What feature do you have right now that costs you the most? We did a scan of the website the other day. And while we were doing it, we thought, this is a normal, plain and Jane thing. Because we didn't go into the WooCommerce settings API hooks to see that they had this elaborate integration using the, the REST API, which was awesome. But in everything that we were scanning, looking, and interacting with, we had never caught it. You catch that by asking questions like, hey, where do you spend the most time or money? And they go, oh, it's this one integration with third party that does all these things, and, go, and all we just do is connect up to the REST API. Yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's good to know. Right? And then lastly, in this section of the store, are you using other sales channels? Right? Are you selling on Amazon? Are you selling on eBay? Are you selling on some other little store? Do you have a whole bunch of other microsites that also sell and connect back to this? I don't know what you, I don't know what you're gonna ask me, but I just want to know: Is this the only place where you're doing sales, or are you doing sales other channels? Oh, I have a physical store. Oh, I have a point of sale. Oh, I do stuff on a mobile app. You don't want to find those things out two thirds into the project when someone else walks in the room and goes, "Hey, where's the where's the mobile app interface?" And you're like, "What mobile app?" Interface? Right? Like the, the site's responsive, you can look at it on mobile app. And I'm like, no, no, no. I mean, like the actual app. It's not in the scope. We never heard about it. Right? So, hey, are you using other sales channels? All right, product details. Okay? These are simple. They're not going to shock you. How many products do you have? How many categories do you have? Hey, are the product photos, the prices, and the descriptions already ready? Are they easily exportable? To, are they already in a spreadsheet? Do you already have this data? Oh, uh, no. No, we were hoping you could help us get photos of the products. You're like, oh, that's interesting. That just added 40 hours to the project, or 100 hours of the project just depends. Right? Are the, are the photos ready? My very first e-commerce project, and it's a long time ago, but my very first one was a florist. And she sent me 300 photos of the flowers. And I opened up every image in Photoshop and cleaned it up. Cleaned up every single photo, cropped it, made it look beautiful, and put it back on their store site so that they could have a really great e-commerce store. I did all this because she was gonna give me the hookup for my wedding. And I was like, that's a good thing. I'll get the florist at a discount because I'll build their e-commerce store. When the emails went out from the e-commerce store, I said, do you have any, where's your email address? What's your email address? Oh, I don't have email. Okay, I'll get you an email account. Well, I don't have anything to read the email. Okay, I guess I'll go to your house and install Outlook. I was their network administrator, their IT configurator, software installer, right? Their image photo toucher upper, and then we got to the part I cared about. And that was the, okay, 
uh, give me the discount. So she's like, well, your bill rounds out to 1200 I told you I was going to hook you up. So make it an even thousand. Yeah. I was young. I was dumb. It happens. All right? How often do you make updates? Are people making updates to their product all the time? Or not much? Right? And what kind of products do you sell? Variable products? Subscription products? Basic products, shippable products, digital products, understand that profile. All right, visitor details, right? Who do you sell to? You sell to consumers? You sell to businesses? Does that mean you need wholesale pricing, right? Help me understand what's going on here, because again, wholesale pricing is one of those things you could go days, weeks into a project and not know that you suddenly need to do that, right? Hey, uh, do you also need to support distributors, people that are actually pushing your products out? Do we need to integrate back to those guys, right? Is your store public, or do you sell only members? Is there a membership component to who can buy? And then, hey, uh, roughly, how many people are visiting? Now, we're going to talk about demand in a second, but just give me a ballpark, right? How many folks are visiting the store on a daily basis? What kind of throughput do we need to be thinking about? All right, order details, right? How many orders do you have in your system today? If you have to migrate that stuff, right, you need to be thinking about that, right? And that's the next question, which is, hey, do I have to worry about bringing all that over? Some people are like, nope, that's an old system, different system, we don't care. And other people are like, oh no, I need all that stuff brought over. That's a, that could be a huge project. Right? Do you manage the orders yourself? Or are you using a third party? And again, you gotta dig into, tell me more about this situation if it is, I use a third party, I use an automated system, something else, right? And that gets us to the last one in here, which is, hey, are you doing any kind of automated fulfillment? Do I have to connect your store up to something else, another system, push data through so it can generate products and ship them out, right? Do I have to do that at all? Is it printful, right? Is it, uh, there, are, there are ones that do uh, other physical products, right? You know, just tell me what I need to understand about this. And then of course, scale. And scale is a hard one, right? Because people may tell you only their history and not tell you what's coming next, right? In the case of the store we worked on last week, their history was decent, but they knew they had a product launch that was gonna be huge, massively different, right? And you go, okay, let's, let's get into it. So what's the most sales you've had in a day, right? What's the most traffic you've had in an hour, right? Do you have any special upcoming promotions, right? And then, my favorite question, if, let's say your store was gonna fail. And they're like, what, what, this is a bad question. Like, ah, just, just go with me, right? If your store was gonna fail, is there a volume where you'd be like, okay, after that, yeah, that would be okay, right? Like if you get 100,000 orders and then it falls over, is that okay? Is it 50,000 an hour, right? Is a million, or, like where is that line that you go, oh, that, I mean, it would suck that it went down, but if we got to this much, it would be great, right? More often than not, we don't ask this question, and then we can end up getting caught over-engineering, right? Imagine that you're thinking it's 50,000 and someone says, oh God, if we could do 300 orders. You're <laughs> like, okay, that's good to know, right? That's very different than 10,000 or 50,000. All right, feature details. These are the ones that you normally are probably asking today, right? Most of the time, right? Hey, do you need the featured products section? Do you need the new products section? Do you have shipping partners you integrate with or that you need to support? Um, are you collecting tax? Are you using a service? Right? Uh, what payment options do you want? These are the questions that when I watch people have this conversation, they normally are talking features. Like I need to go configure a plugin. That's not what building a store is about, right? So if you only ask these questions, all those other things you haven't asked about. And then complications. Now complications is probably, it has more tone in it than I want it to, but it gets complicated, right? Hey, what about multiple languages and multiple currencies, right? Hey, are you selling subscription products? Because that's gonna change things. Uh, wish list features, that's gonna change things, right? Or do you have any other integrations that we need to make sure that we have more? 
right? All of those things, a single answer to one of those, right, could add a day, a week to your product. Lastly, hosting, right? Where is your store hosted right now? Okay? All I'm, I don't care where your site is hosted, right? Really, my secondary question is how much are you paying? Because someone says, I'm running this awesome e-commerce store, but it's super slow, but the design is beautiful, but I pay $3 a month, right? I go, well, we should probably have a conversation about your budget, right? Um, but the other one, right, is, hey, uh, are you going to need staging and testing environments, right? How do you take products to market? What's your process? What do you test? When you want to introduce a new feature, where do you test it? How do you do it? And do you need us involved, or do you have that stuff already on lock, right? And we talked about earlier the training of your staff, right? Do we need to do this? Or do you already have it in place? What's going on, right? If they used another system beforehand, and now they're coming to WooCommerce, they may have a whole lot of expectations just based on what they've done before. And you may have to spend time training. Right? And then lastly, will you need us to test your store for performance? Will you need us involved in running these tests? The, the folks I worked with this last week, they have told their developers for six months, right, there's going to be high traffic. And then when we ask them, well, what testing did you do? And they're like, well, it loads fast on my server, or it loads fast on my desktop. Like, that's not testing. So, 40 questions, right? And the problem that most of us have is we don't spend enough time doing this discovery. We get in over our heads. The last thing I'll tell you is, hey, if you want help selling e-commerce projects, which is not the same as scoping them, my friend Jennifer Bourne has a product over at jenniferborne.com slash e-commerce sales. And she has a wealth of information available to you if you, uh, if you want to get into that. My name is Chris Summa. I work at Liquid Web. You can find me online at at Chris Summa. Thank you very much. I think we have enough time for one, maybe two questions if they're fast. Yeah? Do you want this website? Oh, the slide shared on it. Got it. shipping partner, do you have do you have a preferred method of shipping, do you have a shipping partner, do you have someone you have to integrate with, was in there because, yeah, it's one thing when everyone says the same answer, right, same with payment gateways, right, you hear payment gateways authorized on that Stripe, PayPal, authorized on that Stripe, PayPal, you're like, great, then someone gives you a name you've never heard of, and you're like, wait, what is that, right, and that will take some time. All right, last question. Any third party, yeah? Couldn't you keep part of that, like if it was already working? You told, so the question is, right? What was that thing that was the, Yeah, the rest yeah, of the The question was, if they have a very large integration and it's already working, can you, can you still use that, right? And you go, yes, if the inputs to that API, the calls the API, come from data that you can easily connect the dots on. But imagine that you're coming from an Oracle e-commerce platform to an AP, through an API, and then you come in with WooCommerce, and WooCommerce says, well, I don't store that data, I have this other data. And, and then you're like, oh, but where's this number? I need this number. And they go, oh, yeah, I forgot. That number comes from an internal system that we had to integrate with, and you're like, oh, I have to do another iteration to bring that data over so that I can send it out to them. And I wish I was saying, like, this only happens once in the blue moon. It happens all the time, right? When you're moving platforms especially, because there's things they forgot. They did that thing five years ago. Right? And now they're like, but it should just work. And you're like, no, it won't just work. All right, thank you very much. Have a great day.